Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. <laughs> Hello, Hi. Donna. Hi there. Hi, David. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. We're very excited uh, about today's podcast. Well, let's introduce you to our listeners. Welcome, listeners. This is episode 259. And we're really excited again to have a wonderful guest, Donna Fish, who is a teen therapist in New York. She's an LCSW. She's a level four teen CBT trainer and therapist. And she specializes in eating disorders, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Donna has an incredible CV. She's a guest lecturer for Columbia University School of Social Work, for Harvard Medical School's Continuing Education Department. She's on the faculty of the Center for the Study of Anorexia and Bulimia. She's written and published a book, Take the Fight Out of Food, How to Prevent and Solve Your Child's Eating Problems. And so because of that, because of her publishing the book, she's no, she's she's well known in the world of therapists. And she has been on multiple radio and television shows. She's been a consultant to several hospitals, schools, universities, including New York City's Administration for Children's Services and for Head Start. You know, besides being a great therapist, Donna was a professional dancer. And because of her dancing experience, she currently consults with the School of American of the American Ballet Theater, the Juilliard School, and NYU's dance department, where she's offered a seminar called Mental Fitness, Mental Fitness, How to Survive and Thrive in the Dance World. She lives in Manhattan, where she runs a private practice, and she also writes for psychology today. Whew. That's incredible. Donna didn't know that all about you. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Well, before we jump in, let's read some comments from listeners. So, you know, people listen to podcasts all the time. This is 254, but someone recently listened to podcast 26 called St Scared Stiff, the Exposure Model. That was part four of the Exposure Model. And her name was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth wrote in and said, I love this podcast. I just used the exposure therapy this afternoon. I said I would take a family member to the airport on the opposite side of Houston, where I live. I have been petrified of driving on Houston highways and on the massive overpasses. So today I set out to retrain my thoughts and my reactions. My heart was pounding, my hands were shaking, and my brain kept trying to spiral on the highway. But I kept using the techniques I learned in your books, Dr. Burns. I told myself I was okay, with a 10 to 15% anxiety threshold of fear, because that helps me stay alert in the city and be intentional with my time. But the cost of continuing not to drive on highways and overpasses in my city is just too high of a cost to keep paying. If I wind up fainting, well then, okay. My family can come get me from the hospital or the side of the road and we'll carry on with our day. I chose not to let the fear of fainting keep me from going out. I appreciate your messages so much, Dr. Burns. Thank you for what you do, Elizabeth. That was beautiful. That was the woman who, that was the note she wrote before she went on the overpasses. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, sadly, she, 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 She's not with us anymore. <laughs> because she fainted. But it was a lovely sentiment. <laughs> Possibly. Possibly. Yes, I'm just being my, my silly self, but that, that's a really neat thing. And and congratulations and kudos on your bravery and at, at facing that 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 fear. It's it's just really neat to see uh, when people get liberated from from a fear or a phobia. Yeah, true. 
And then, you know, we recently, June on June 14th, we published episode 246, which was titled The Night My Childhood Ended, Part One. And we got it. And that was yesterday, by the way, in terms of today when we're recording. It came out yesterday, and this was the first email uh, response we got, because this was also facing a fear. This this was uh, uh, Todd in our Tuesday group doing his personal work, uh, and it'll be two podcasts of course, they'll, they'll both be published by the time you hear this one, but on this horrible trauma he experienced when he was eight years old. Right. And Ed G., who's one of our most prolific listeners, he wrote to us and said, I listened to this podcast yesterday, and I was truly at a loss for words. What a heartbreaking story. Two brothers, one as young as eight years old, witnessing such a horrendous and violent act. Todd's resilience and courage are inspiring and an encouragement to all. So true. Well, thank you for that. I know that Todd is going to appreciate that also, Ed. I, I, I forwarded it right off to him, and I'm sure you're going to be getting a lot more based on not only today's podcast, but the part two um, ne next week when people can hear the exciting conclusion of that, the live work that, that we did with you that night. And now on to Donna and some really exciting stuff, <clears throat> not only on your amazing and illustrious career, but on your current work with uh, individuals with eating disorders, which in a recent survey uh, done at Oxford, and which will be published this evening, actually, on, on CNN, they, they've determined that 98% of human beings struggle with, 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 with eating disorders. What? Really? No, Absolutely. not really. I just made it up, but it <laughs> sounds so that good, and I, I think know. it's probably not far from the truth. It, you know what? Yeah, I love that you're bringing that up because, you know, per se, again, you know, real kind of strictly defined eating disorders, like in, the, you know, classified in media, are like maybe, you know, I forget much lower percentage, but 98% of humans have some variant of disordered eating. So it, it's so much more, as I say, and I like what you say, David, about you treat problems and not diagnoses. Yeah, right. I like to ask, you know, I always ask my first question when it, somebody comes in with an eating disorder and they're saying, you know, saying it's a problem, I'll say, well, what exactly is the problem and how is it What's the problem? How is it a problem? And another part that's really important, I always ask, whose problem is it? Because I get referrals from all over, you know, with eating disorders, you might get a referral from the school or from the parent or from the, you know, doctor. And you have a lot of, you know, parents who might be, they may not want to, it may not be their agenda that uh, they want their child to be treated for an eating issue or, um, you know, the teacher is calling and saying there's a real problem with the kid. And, you know, so it's always a little bit complicated. There's a lot of uh, cooks in the stew at times with referrals for eating disorders. So I like to really start with that, pro that question about what is the problem. And eating, you know, disordered eating can be really on a spectrum of extremes. And so it's good to really find out, well, exactly how is this a problem for you as well? Yeah, I love what you're saying. The uh, Someone in the pediatric psychiatry department at Stanford came on one of the Sunday hikes, and she was saying how a lot of parents have this kind of uh, garage mechanic view of, 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 of psychiatry and psychology, like drop the kid off in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, get the, the oil change, and then pick them up cured in, in, in the afternoon, and right. the child doesn't have any agenda at all for, for what the parents are trying to impose. So it's it's amazingly important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is your, was your experience with dance something that got you interested in working with people who have eating disorders? Totally, totally. When I was a dancer, I was always on a diet. You know, I was always trying to, thinking I had to lose, you know, five pounds to when I was auditioning or performing. And then I would, you know, always be kind of thinking, oh, I have to, I could eat this, but I can't eat that. So I would classify foods as like, 
you know, good food, bad food, foods I could eat, foods I couldn't. And then I would notice that like on a Sunday, let's say if I hadn't, you know, if I finished a show or I didn't have an audition, I would then just eat all, you know, all the foods that I wanted to eat that I couldn't eat, like cookies and ice cream and things that were so, so, so called fattening that I'd, I would be restricting myself. And I never entered into the zone of full blown, you know, anorexia or bulimia, I never purged, but I was always on that yo-yo sort of, you know, restricting. And then, you know, if I wasn't doing, you know, in a show or something, I would really want to binge. And then the funny thing is that when I got my first job in out of school, when I went back to social work school and I realized, I thought, man, I'm not going to, like, if I gain five pounds, I'm not going to get fired. I'm not going to lose my job if I gain weight. And I'm wearing clothing. It'll hide everything anyhow. So who cares? And I started, I sort of taught myself, I retaught myself how to eat. Um, and, and I kind of created this rule of thumb that I had to wait. And I had to say, of course, I can have this. I can have this food that I used to say I couldn't have, I would restrict. And what that did was it, it kind of reconnected me with my body signals and my ability to say, oh, do I even feel like having this? Do I really need this? Do I really want it right now? And I was able to wait and then say, oh, of course I could have that chocolate bar. And it ended up reducing the amount I would eat over time because I didn't compartmentalize it into, oh, well, this day I can have this. And then if I thought I had blown my diet, I would then, you know, sort of have the whole bag of cookies or whatever. So it really helped that kind of on off pattern of eating that is so typical of a lot of disordered eating, right? And diets and diet mentality. And over time, it completely cured me and just took away any preoccupation. It actually ended up invariably helping me lose that extra five pounds I ever fretted about. And I never weighed myself since. And I just, it's completely freed me from the preoccupation, ironically. And so I kind of used that system. And then I did my, I did a three year training program at the Center for Study of Anorexia and Bulimia. But my goal was really, I just saw so many dancers and actors and performers struggling with body image and their bodies. And I, my goal was to really help people just love to eat and enjoy their food without being overly preoccupied. And, and using up all of that mental and emotional energy fretting about what they ate, what they shouldn't have eaten. And it just, I saw so many, you know, especially dancers really spend so much emotional and, and psychic energy um, worrying about this at the expense really of their craft and, and their social lives. And it just had so many negative, you know, so many negative components to it. So I, you know, I did my training and then I started to work uh, with dancers and performers, and I kind of started from there. And then I had this idea for a book. I thought, because I, I developed a four-step program that's in my book. And the irony is, like David, when I began to train in team, a lot of the decision-making form that you developed, I, I created this balance sheet exercise for kids to think through, if the if I eat this, how will I feel? Versus if I don't eat this, how will I feel? And thinking about it in different ways pros and cons. And it just it re so resonated for me, all of the tools and team. And it fits so beautifully with the kind of work I was doing in my work with eating disorders and, and what became curative. Um, and so I had started to work with, you know, people with eating disorders, and they ended up really getting, you know, cured. And then they would come back to me and say, when they were pregnant and having children saying, Oh, my God, you know, it helped so much. But now I'm so scared, I'm going to Give, I'm going to give my kid an eating disorder. And so I thought, well, if I could put this program into a prevention program for parents, and then I met this agent and he was like, hey, you've got an idea for a book. And, you know, we put it together and shopped it around and houses were bidding on it. And that was exciting and wrote the book. So oh, congratulations. That's Thank neat. You. Yeah. One of the things that you said uh, that seems to have been not necessarily the key to it, but an important key to your own personal change and the philosophy you later developed when you're uh, treating people, helping people, is to, to say, yes, I, I can have this instead of uh, trying to control yourself. 
exactly. and and have 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 rigid rigid rules, which was putting you on a kind of a yo-yo, uh, uh, you know, of restricting and and binging, exactly. and and that par- paradoxically, by letting up on yourself and giving your permission to eat that chocolate bar. That kind of shifted certain things exactly. in your mind and your, and your psyche, and and it, it kind of you said it, it, I think you said it kind of this freed me and cured me or some, something like exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. It helped me really put into practice experimenting. So sort of using an experimental method of testing out. Well, if I give myself leeway, and I kind of created this rule, like I had to really want it, and and. And I could really, you know, I could even just think I wanted it and, and feel like I needed it. I, I, you know, I think it, and it made me think of, and I use this a lot, the addiction habit mood log and the should statements, you yeah. know, um, and how that thinking creates this restriction. And we know in the eating disorder biz that, res- that simply the thought of restrict- restricting, just the thought actually induces compulsive overeating. Yeah, and it, interesting. And, and it can create binging, and so it's it's very powerful. This sort of and it's such a social. It's so powerful in our culture. It's so embedded in our culture. These norms around oh, I should have this, I shouldn't have that, and you know, I'm I I, I was bad today. You know, I ate blah blah blah, um, and you know, the irony is that it really uh, it really can free you up and. There's a lot of really good data about it, um, and the, and the tools in team really be, seem sort of beautifully in working with eating disorders, and I love to kind of weave that in and and use a lot of the tools. Yeah, it's it's a little different approach for sure. You mentioned the addic- addiction habit and mood log. Maybe you can bring that to life. That's one of the tools I created for habits and addictions, and maybe you can uh, just give us a tiny little. Uh, example of how what what that tool is and mm-hmm. and and how it how it works. I, I'm not sure we've have we done anything recently on the uh, devil's advocate technique, Rhonda. No, or, we haven't. Yeah, no. maybe we could do that now. Mm-hmm. We we can and we will, <laughs> and the time is now. <laughs> so- and then, I'm in an idiotic mood today. I hope that's okay. <laughs> that's and good. we for, we forgot our our pal. What's his name? Doctor Nose. Oh, oh! I thought he was only coming when when Matt was here. Doesn't he probably him? will? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Donna, you were telling us before we started recording that Robert Schachter, who was who we featured on a podcast recently, because he had he ran a a feeling great book club too in New York, and he introduced you to team. And you, then yes. you, but previously yes. to that, you had written a book and you said you had a four step program. How do you integrate team, like David asked, within the program that you've developed? So I, I love that you're asking this. And, and again, just shout out to Bob because he really got me into, got, well, you hooked me, David, when I did your workshop um, on panic in, in New Jersey years ago. And then um, when I did, I was a volunteer for externalization of voices and it kind of just blew me out of the water and I'm such a skeptic about different models of therapy and everybody's being a convert to this and that. And I'm like, okay, I'd like to learn lots of different things. And um, I'm big on like, let me know as much as I can to fit the person and their needs instead of them having to fit what I do into the school of therapy I do. So I'm, I'm pretty skeptical, but Bob was just like singing the praises of team therapy. And I respect him so much. We worked together at Mount Sinai and I had so much respect. I thought, well, if Bob's into this and then you blew me out of the water with that uh, role play exercise. So I became a convert and did the group with Taylor and Bob that he was, they were doing together. And uh, the rest is history. I've been doing it for quite some time now. Um, but, and just to give them a plug, I think Bob Schachter is a New York psychologist, clinical psychologist, as is Taylor Chesney. And I think, do, do they work together at Taylor Center? Yeah, yeah, the Feeling Good Institute here. And, and they're both great. I recently referred a patient to Bob who looked exceptionally severe. And I was so grateful that he was willing to take her and and help her out. And I think he saw her for three or four sessions uh, and uh, I think he, he he worked with her in two two hour sessions, and I, I, I believe all of her symptoms d- d- disappeared. It was 
it was really fantastic. And I, I saw not only what a tremendous uh, team CBT therapist he, he is, but uh, also what a, a wonderful heart he has to have helped this person out who really didn't have uh, re resources. Uh, and uh, I'm sure what he did for her was really life-saving. And I think what you do for people is life-saving and life-changing too, uh, as you are about to reveal. Well, I, I'm glad that you're saying, talking about the life-saving piece, because one of the things about eating disorders that's a bit unique or different than any other psychiatric disorder, aside from obviously severe depression with the possibility of suicide, is that there is a, a medical component that has a mortality rate to it. So um, that's something that's really important to assess. And so whenever I get a patient, um, it's, there's a psychoeducation component to uh, doing a kind of an evaluation and being able to dangle the carrot um, and even ha you know, offer the gentle ultimatum because I'm, you know, I need to make sure that I don't need anyone to change and that they're medically stable so that I'm not under the burden of them changing their behaviors right away. I can't feel that pressure. And that's a mistake that sometimes therapists make initially because patients always come in wanting to change, right? But the use also, David, and you've helped me and team is really, really unique in this and powerful is the use of paradox, especially again, in something like eating disorders where there are so many good reasons to maintain the behaviors and the patterns of thinking. And, um, and it's very powerful. And there's a tremendous amount of resistance to the change. And even if people come in initially saying they want to change, they certainly don't want to, they never want to gain weight, right? So they, don't, they want change, but they certainly don't want to gain weight. So I use a lot of, I sort of dangle the carrot using cycle, cycle oil. I'll give you an example of that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, you know, and this is sort of with the agenda setting, I'll give you an example of where certainly sometimes parents, if you have a teen and um, they have anorexia, and the parents may not want them to necessarily get better because they function at a really high level. They're quite perfectionistic, um, but they're really in danger. And I'll set it up where they, you know, the gentle ultimatum is you have to get a medical checkup. I have to make sure that they're in good medical shape and, and safe, basically, that they don't need a higher level of care in order to enter into therapy with me. But let's say that's happening. One of the things I like to help is help parents understand in person some of the medical kind of consequences of their continued behavior. And this is one that parents could sometimes finally get hooked on, which is that excessive restriction and malnutrition through anorexia literally shrinks the brain over time. And it's, we could see that. Wait, on wait, could you say that again? Yeah, excessive malnutrition and restriction through severe anorexia literally shrinks the brain over time. Mm -hmm. And we could literally see this on PET scans. Sometimes that's the only thing that will help a parent be motivated to engage in any kind of work to help their, you know, their child be in treatment or their, their sort of teen or young adolescent, because a lot of them are really, really wanting their child to be successful, their kid to be successful. They don't want their brains to shrink, right? So that's something that they can relate to. Oops, sorry, is that, oh, that's not me, good. Hmm. Um, and then there's other, you know, things, medications really are not effective when people are malnourished. So um, people often think like they'll be on psychiatric medications and not what, knowing why it's not treating their depression. But, you know, the nutritional piece of things is very important. Um, and the anxiety really increases and the preoccupation increases and this obsessive thoughts, rumination increases simply by, you know, th that's a medical consequence of severe restriction. So, there's a, and then the other thing is like when somebody is bulimic, let's say, and throwing up, you know, I'll often say to them, like, I didn't think it was actually your goal to be more bloated, was it? 
And they'll be like, no, I hate the bloating, which is why I keep throwing up. And another part thing, and, and I'll, I'll help them understand that throughout time, what happens is like through excessive throwing up, if you think of it logically, when we have a stomach flu, we get dehydrated, right? When you're throwing up a lot, you're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. And so your body is dehydrated. And so you end up actually hydrating your system, almost like pumping it up. And so you're more sensitive to, you know, hydration. And so people end up getting more bloated when they throw up. Hmm. And so I'll often, if I can dangle that carrot and help them see that if, it, if over time they're able to decrease and eliminate their purging, they'll eliminate their bloating and they'll be able to reduce the effect of bloating also. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to dangle these very concrete kind of carrots to help them see. Another one is oftentimes they'll say, well, I don't want to change anything because I really don't want to lose control. I'm scared to lose control. I'm scared I'll gain weight. And I'll say, well, what is, is there anything that you don't like about this? And they'll often refer to the preoccupation, the mental preoccupation that really comes out of severe, except, you know, excessive restriction, and and then compensating with purging or, you know, excessive exercise, um, they'll say, yeah, that's something I would like to actually reduce, um, and so then we can also get into the process resistance and things like that. So there's lots of ways to dangle the carrot, but it is really important to have a psychoeducational piece so they have an understanding of what this behavior is doing and the effects of it concretely um, and how it's not necessarily helping. But in terms of, you know, team methods, I use the, I like to use the paradoxical decision-making form because again, you know, there's lots of really good reasons and that triple paradox is really awesome. I was using that with somebody the other day um, and we had a great time like filling out all good reasons, all the advantages, you know, of her restriction, but then the binging too. I, I'm just, you know, I was amazed at how many advantages there were and, um, you know, to feeling the obvious one, which is always feeling like I could control, but also feeling that pleasure. There's an intense pleasure of even anticipating a binge, especially if you've been very restrictive. It's like a feeling of freedom. It's a feeling of being able to let go of control. I run, you know, paradoxically, of feeling free, of finally giving yourself something. Of Celebrating life. Exactly. Mm -hmm. With exactly. wonderful food and all I want of it and as much as I want uh, of it. Like, can exactly. we just uh, slow down a little? You're saying so many fantastic things so quickly, so we want our listeners to, to catch on. But you mentioned the triple paradox, and that's a, a technique I developed really not too many years ago. And it, it sounds irresponsible at first, but it's, it's, it's really it can be helpful. And let's say someone, to make it very simple, has, has an eating disorder. Or, or an eating difficulties. There are no such things as eating disorders, but problems with with overeating. And it, mm -hmm. it it came to me on a hike. Actually, I can even remember the person who asked and on one of my Sunday hikes, and she said, "Well, can you can you help me with you know my my overeating? I've just been heavy my my whole life, and." I really need to lose some weight and all of this. And I, I said, well, okay, but I have a few questions to ask you. First, let's look at some, all of the benefits of, of overeating. Mm -hmm. it, it, eating as much as you want, whenever you want, whatever you want. And she said, well, how can there be any advantages? I said, come on, give me a break. Yeah. There's a tenth, the tons of talking about one of the greatest things in the world yes. here. And so suddenly she starts saying, well, I, I love this kind of food. And I love that kind of food. And it's just so rewarding to eat and I can comfort myself and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And we came up with about 12 benefits, yeah. uh, wonderful things about binging, uh, unlimited binging. Absolutely. And now she thought I was going to come in and say the other side of the coin. But I said, and now tell me, what are some of the uh, many ho horrendous disadvantages and horrible things about dieting and losing weight? And she said, but that, that's what I want to do. I said, give me a break. You do not want to diet. You do not want to, you know, uh, start ex exercising. You say you haven't been exercising in a long time. You're, you're pretty overweight. It's going to suck to high heaven. Mm 
Mm-hmm. She said, you're right. So we started listing all these disadvantages of dieting and exercising and mm-hmm. uh, and all of that. And then I said, the third thing I said, and, and now tell me, wh- wh- what does this overeating show about you and your core values as a human being that's just totally awesome? What are, what, what are the beautiful things it shows about you? And again, she couldn't understand how there could be anything good about all this overeating. And, and I said, well, for, for one thing, uh, the, the Dalai Lama said that happiness is the purpose of life. And all this, when you overeat, that's like gives you real happiness. So one thing it shows about you is you're, you're a very spiritual person. Mm. <laughs> and then she started laughing. And then she said, it also shows that I'm a rebel. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to conform, conform to the, the, the rules of society and on and on and on. And so we had all of these three different ways of encouraging her to, to, to keep overeating. And then I said, well, gosh, given all these positives, it looks like you, you, you don't have a problem. I don't see that we should. There's a lot of ways that to, to diet and lose weight and all of that. But that makes no sense to me at all. What, what do you think? And she says, I am totally converted. I'm 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 going to start dieting and exercising and losing weight. And I said, "Well, did you need my help with any of that?" She said, "Absolutely not. I'm I'm ready to go." And it was a surprise to to me. Uh, but but I've I've had that every time I've used that triple paradox. But it's so hard for therapists to use because they right. think they're somehow going to encourage the person to keep eating, and that it's their job to fix people. Right. And exactly. that whole attempt to fix people is the cause of therapeutic failure, especially in the eating disorders. And if you look at the outcome literature on all of the eating disorders, it, it is not it's not very promising. You hear all these things advertised on TV, but if you le- look at real uh, outcome studies, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the data is not, mm-hmm. not encouraging. In fact, the only thing I've seen that's really... Uh, shows something and I'll shut up here because you're the expert and I am not but is the coercive treatment for anorexia nervosa developed at uh, at uh, in London at the, at the Maudsley mm-hmm. and that seems to show a good 50% rec- recovery rate with uh, teenagers with severe anorexia nervosa who would mm-hmm. be dying otherwise but it's like what you said that the the parents have to buy into the program of, of pushing the child to eat and not taking no for, for an answer. I will now shut up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, I'm loving your example with your, you know, your fellow hiker. And, um, you know, it's funny. I was just doing that triple paradox with somebody the other day who's, you know, got quite a binging issue and is severely overweight. And when I was doing it, she was like, what kind of therapist are you? <laughs> You're really she, said, a what? she said, what kind of therapist are you? You're really a different, I have never heard of any of this before. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. She, you know, she was shooting herself from day one and, you know, just always telling me what she should be doing. And so the irony here too, and another piece of the paradox I'll add in is that everybody who's including the person who was the hiker, who was, you know, uh, enjoying the overeating and and compulsively or overeating perhaps the difficulty and this is the part where there you got to help people with to some degree is if you don't you cannot deal with any compulsive overeating or binging if you're not willing to first look at the restriction you have to stop restricting actually and that's the hard part because people always think and in fact it kind of goes like this the thought that you're going to restrict the next day is what actually lets you off the hook to binge more. Yeah. And I always say, because like, if you think of it logically too, if you just spread out, spread out those calories over the week, like your body's going to keep working on those calories. But if you're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have this food tomorrow and I just had a bite or I had a, a taste of it, or I really want it. And then you think, oh, but I won't have it tomorrow. It kind of gives you a bit of a, you know, bit of a license to just say, oh, screw it. I'm not going to really check in with my body and even notice how full I am or how satisfied I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so you start to disconnect from your body's signals. There's no satiation. And in fact, most people, when they're in that mode, they're just stuffing food. They're not even tasting it. They're not even enjoying it. Mm. Like in binging, you're actually, most people aren't even enjoying their food. I'm like, oh, for enjoyment. It's like, hey, if you're going to eat, you might as well enjoy it. Taste it, savor it. Be Like give it to yourself, right? Uh, guilt is kind of one of the worst things to add into eating and then ends up making you sort of shut down and then not even notice if you're full. So I like to, the paradox is that people have to be willing to stop restricting. I, I, I was do, working with a compulsive overeater a few years ago and she had tried absolutely every single program, every diet program. She had failed three gastroplasty surgeries. She oh my gosh. Gained, gained and regained a hundred pounds three times. And she was pretty discouraged. Her psychiatrist referred her to me. And I, I kind of love those cases because, like, you, you know, you can't fail, right? Like, <laughs> you're at the bottom yeah. anyhow. So I, I kind of, we went over it. And the one thing that she really didn't want to do was become housebound. Her mother was housebound. And she loved her job. And so that was the carrot. She didn't want to gain more weight. I said, let's stop. You forget losing weight. You know, let's take that focus off. I said, but... She didn't want to gain more weight. So I said, okay, are you willing? And, and I said, okay, are you willing to try this? Are you willing to um, eat? What's your favorite food? And she said, pasta. I said, awesome. Are you willing to eat pasta every day? And she said, you're crazy that I will gain more weight. I said, nah, just hold off. <laughs> and so we sort of plugged that in and she was really willing to work on the restrictive thinking that was creating the binge and the habit of her binging behavior and her compulsive overeating. And over time, she ended up actually losing, she was about 350 pounds, she was like five feet. And she lost weight, she started to, and she was eating pasta, she was eating you know, she was able to start to incorporate other, you know, foods she was frightened of. It was like almost like a phobia. Um, people develop these like phobias, you know, anxiety is about I can't have this or these beliefs. If I eat that, I will lose control. And I use a lot of the experimental method and things like that. But she was really willing to kind of take a leap of faith and say, okay, let me try this. But we had to work hard on paradoxing the um, restricting thing, the restrictive thinking. Um, and, and that really ultimately worked. She hit a plateau where she said, you know, I hit 200 pounds. I've been here before. I'll never get past it. I said, you know what? It's okay. Your body's going to regulate. Don't worry. It's going to keep up. And she, we did a lot of work on her, on her mood all, as well. And some of the negative thoughts and the, and I use the, the daily mood log as well. And a lot of the uh, methods to help with mood and distorted thinking. To, to also offset some of the, you know, temptation to go back into the habit behavior. So it's really important as well in working with eating disorders to use not just the habit mood log and the, you know, once you get through the paradoxical decision making, but really working on the mood component and yeah. you can dovetail back and forth. Sure. And then she sort of made it through that kind of hump and, and kept going and hit this, plat you know, wonderful sort of set point weight for herself. That looks like amazing work with an exceptionally challenging uh, person. I think you said she had two stomach surgeries and yeah. still yeah. was not, not helping her. And it sounds to me like you're using uh, at least three powerful dimensions in your treatment program. One, one is, of course, motivational, both with dangling the, parad the, the carrot, gentle exactly. ultimatum, exactly. Uh, par paradoxical techniques yes. as well yes and then you're also using uh be behavioral uh, techniques mm -hmm. uh, of uh let, let's let's start eating in in a more you know uh stop skipping meals and exactly stop and and and, yes. and that type of thing and then also a uh cognitive uh, uh, approach in this sense but working with positive distortions Mm -hmm. more than de negative distortions although you you see both exactly. but to to to, to ch change the the inner dialogue uh, that 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 that's going on 
And then my other quick thing is that uh, when you were talking about the binging, it's almost like, uh, I mean, the restricting, when you're restricting, it's almost like you're, you're earning your right to binge. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and again, what's challenging is you could look at, and I like to do the triple paradox, looking at the advantages of the binging and the, you know, the overeating, but also the restricting. And so we yeah. look at both because we want to oh, really yeah. look at all the advantages. You know, and people say things like, oh, it really helps me feel less chaotic. But it's just the thought, okay, I will be able to restrict. I'm going to be really strong. And, you know, the, it makes me feel really good. It does soothe. I mean, they, it really works, actually, um, to help soothe. And, and the part, too, that I love to connect with people is I always, and I, this was another thing about why I love working with eating, people with eating disorders. There was a very strong connection to the right to self-determination, like that feeling of like, well, I'm going to eat the way I want to eat. Yeah, right. And I celebrate that. I'm like, I love how stubborn you are, how persistent you are, how you want to do what you want to do. That's a phenomenal, that's a hugely phenomenal, you know, value and trait. And it's helped you. There's so many advantages of that. We just want to make it work for you instead of hurting you. We're going to sort of turn this around to help it work for you. But that's a fantastic value, right? And if you think of it, logically, eating is the most personal thing. It's And it's the thing that kids and babies have control over. They have no control over anything. But when going, mm -mm, right? when you're feeding them. They know when they don't want any more. I did a study at Stanford on the uh, emotional causes of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, the chance to gather data from about 170 consecutively admitted inpatients. And then we did an exhaustive uh, the survey of all all of their negative uh, feelings, de depression, uh, all of the anxiety disorders, loneliness, all the personality disorders, uh, to to see what were the and we we had sixty very accurately measured d d mood dimensions on on these patients, and then we had a very good assessment of all of the eating disorders. You know their their weight. Their height, the uh, all the symptoms of anorexia nervosa, the number of binges they did per per day per per, per week, and then it's like which which of, of these negative emotions or diagnoses or however you want to look at it have have the greatest uh, impact in in stimulating uh, you know so overeating or bulimia or anorexia or whatever. Uh, do you have do you have any any guesses on, on that or I, mean, I, can, I can just spit out the answer or the answers but I think I've heard you give this answer before. oh yeah so I'm not okay. gonna cheat that's a cheat <laughs> right it, it was surprising because there, there there weren't any correlations with with, with with anything at all and I it was ki kind of a surprise the only correlation was that the more depressed people were the more that low, that they had low self-esteem, or, or you know loneliness that to mention the, the less they ate mm -hmm. and and the less they weighed but 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 that was that was kind of a shock now you know any study has loopholes so it might not have been a valid a valid study but that was uh one of the reasons i love research is because it almost always show when i'm doing research shows me whatever theory i'm testing can't be confirmed, but uh, I, I found that was what was interesting. I, I, I don't know. I don't, since you've heard that, I don't know if you've thought about that in the context of of your work. I certainly see it as a as an addiction. You know, the temptation scale I developed had massive correlations with all of the uh, ha habits and addictions that you you're, you Absolutely. have all these tempting thoughts, like what you're talking about, right. all these obsessions and right. things like that, and that's really really kind of where the action is. And then the other thing that I, I, I thought about is that another thing that's really leads to a lot of the eating problems that we didn't see 150 years ago is just the wealth that we have, the advertising mm -hmm. for all of these desirable foods. I mean, you see them on TV, like the latest hamburger or something. 
I mean, and it just looks like, oh, my God, that looks so fantastic. Do we have any of those whatever whoppers or something in our neighborhood? And, and that it that it's really uh, confirms kind of the addiction model, because I don't think they had all these eating disorders in the, like, 1880s and stuff like that. When Well, they've always had, I mean, eating disorders have always existed. You know, anorexia, you can trace it back to the early 1500s. Fifteen um, hundreds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there, there's absolutely cases. Interesting. Again, I mean, there was not a pervasive social cultural model of thin being, you know, an aesthetic that people had to aspire to. And for men, it's like having this chiseled, perfect body. And so, there's no doubt, eating disorders have been on the rise, and people have way more disordered eating now. Um, and even like, my God, in the fifties, and if you look at the aesthetics and the I, you know, the ideal, you know, for beauty. I mean, Marilyn Monroe be, would be put on a starvation diet. She wouldn't be in the movies at, at her weight. Yeah. And the beauty queens. So the aesthetic of, of young women and girls, you know, girls start to diet at younger and younger ages because the sort of beauty ideal is so ridiculously off the mark. And even models, their bodies yeah. are, you know, filtered through the imaging systems. So it's unrealistic. And at the same time, you know, here they're stuck with these images all the time through Instagram and, and so much social media. So I really feel for young kids growing up where so much is, is sort of fixated in their mind of this is how I'm supposed to look. And it doesn't fit, you know, reality and real, you know, it doesn't really fit a lot of the aesthetics. Yeah. And, uh, and so and there's you a experienced lot of that problems. personally. And yeah. in your career and with the people you were with, it was a daily reality for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and incredible. there's a lot of eating disorders in the dance world, my God. There um, was a but, woman came into one of the inpatient groups at Stanford in a wheelchair, and she had anorexia nervosa, and she looked pretty darn thin, but was really nice. All the anorexia patients seemed to be so nice. I don't know if that was just... Well, you know, that brings me to when you were talking about diagnoses, there's always a, a strong comorbidity with yeah. an eating disorder, with anxiety and depression, sometimes OCD. Oh, I, I was, see. When I, and, and, you know, we talk about the hidden emotion model, right? Oh, yeah. Team. And the niceness is, you know, covering up a lot of hidden emotion. And so what when you're working with someone with eating disorders, you know, there's a lot of different levels. And so, again, there's different methods that I'm going to be using at different t points in time. Yes. And right. the, you know, the beginning of, like you were saying, whenever anybody is eating in a way where they're res excessively restricting and then binging and purging and, or pur you know, people purge through exercise, they purge not just through vomiting, through Ipecac, through all kinds of different ways. Um, oh, another little carrot I dangle is that did you guys know why people with bulimia are usually normal weight or sometimes even higher? Do you have any clue why? No. No. So at the beginning, people get kind of addicted in some ways to the behavior of throwing up because it they do lose weight initially. But our bodies are so smart, right? Oh. At, our bodies adapt. And so when you throw up, after about three months, your body habituates and it only gets rid of a hundred calories and it keeps the rest. <laughs> wow. And so yeah. it's really discouraging. And that's why, in fact, you see. And so I help that's another sort of dangling of the carrot. So I'm like, I I know you really are trying and thinking this is helping you get rid of those calories that you you, you ate yeah. that night. And then it's you know, you're you're bloating more and then you're thinking you need to not eat the next day, but it's actually the not eating the next day that's actually then setting you up to for the binge later on. When you're yeah. vulnerable and you're tired and your mood's down and et cetera, et cetera. So just circling back, initially, it is really important to help people get into a, a structured eating kind of program. Do, they can't do any intuitive eating. Intuitive eating comes last. Do, does it give you any mileage that you can say to your patients, I know where you're at. I've been there myself and I can show you the way out of the woods. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. patient at Stanford uh, was looking really thin and, and uh, in her wheelchair. And I said, "How are you doing?" And she she says, "Oh, I'm doing great. I've been helped a lot." Mm -hmm. And and I and I said, "Well, what 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 do you mean? You know, what in what way have you been helped?" She said, oh, I, "I've gained ten pounds." 
And I said, that's fantastic. How, how much are you, do you weigh now? And she said, oh, I'm up to 58 pounds. Oh, my Lord. Oh. Yeah. It's, just, it's like a horrible, yeah. no, it's horrible, really, that's life-threatening. Tough, very, very. And also, I mean, on the inpatient unit, when I was working in psych, um, we had a 40-year-old woman transferred from Ortho who had had a hip uh, break, and she, and she was transferred to our unit for depression. And I'm thinking to myself, Nobody was thinking she has anorexia. And I'm thinking, why on earth is a 40-year-old woman breaking her hip? And I thought, anorexia, oh. because of the low estrogen. If you don't get your period, you have no estrogen. And then you have bone loss. And so that's a progressive, you And know, you're saying that people with anorexia stop their menstrual cycles? Yeah, yeah. And then they have low estrogen, they lose bone, and so it compromises growth. Bone density. But it also, yeah, bone density becomes a big problem. And well, that's the fourth dimension you bring to your work. Uh, I mentioned three so far, but a fourth would be uh, a sharp awareness of the medical issues involved in some of these yeah. disorders. Yeah, no, that's really, really important. That's why the psychoed is so important. And also setting up a team so that, you know, I'm working with a medical doctor to track. I don't weigh people um, because I don't, you know, that's not. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a dietitian. Um, and so it's important to make sure that they're safe medically and stable. And, and it's important for me to know kind of, and a lot of physicians actually don't know much, or a lot of them don't know about eating disorders. I had, unfortunately, an adolescent, a 15-year-old, she was a soccer player who had severe bulimia. And her doctor, adolescent doctor, physician was not, you know, doing panels on her potassium and, and all the electrolytes. And so she was at risk for passing out and having some cardiac problems, actually. Um, but certainly passing out when she was, you know, throwing up so much. So it's really, really important to be able to make sure that there's medical safety. Because again, I cannot be under pressure of needing the person to change their behaviors. Um, Absolutely, that's the know. key. You yeah. know, when, anytime we're trying to rescue or save someone, the prognosis for a good outcome is, is dims very greatly. Uh, t- tell us how you treat people uh, using all of your amazing skills and personal experience and 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 charisma as 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 well. Do you do you see them? individually once a week do you see them for one hour sessions two hour sessions you do you do groups how, how do you a- actually function so then inc- as you answer that tell us how you incorporate team because you talked a lot about techniques but do you also do testing and assess yes. the motivation yeah, yeah, tell us yeah. about that too oh, uh, absolutely so i do work i'm an outpatient you know therapist i'm in private practice so i see people in my office i see and and it really depends um i'll sometimes do an intensive um do more intensive sessions but i'll see people like once a week um initially i'll do an assessment a uh, complete assessment i do the brief mood survey i use some of the tools um and i like to get a good rounded assessment also of all the functioning um family issues all kinds of you know aspects of what's going on in their life um and i like to use the um miracle cure question very uh Mm, very very quickly um that's another thing people are like wow nobody's ever asked me that um and so I'll, I'll kind of get to, well, what exactly do they want help with, right? Well, what is, and, and I use a lot of specificity. We want to get some meat on the bones, as one of my teachers, Daniel Minty, always says. Um, uh, what, get some specificity. And so the brief mood survey really helps with that. Um, and, and I can- You really, mean the daily mood log? Well, the, I always use the brief mood survey. I do the testing. Um, so I use the brief mood survey oh, yeah. um, before and after sessions. Oh, yeah. The empathy. I follow the team model. You know, I, I have found that it is the most useful model, to be honest, for anything, the approach. And so the testing is really important to be able to get more specific. It's easy to just talk about stuff and not really get some data there and um, know where you know what you're do, doing. Do, do you use the evaluation of therapy session where they're rating 100%. you on empathy and helpfulness? Totally, hundred. How, how do you do? What are what are your scores on empathy and helpfulness? 
not not mm -hmm. wanting to be personal, but this is where we get really interesting. <laughs> well, you know, it's I, I usually at the beginning, um, I get great marks for warmth. <laughs> my tendency, and it's interesting, like my sort of weak spot is, I forget, it's it's usually I'll get like a lower, like a, what is it, a, f a three or something on the, did your therapist know exactly how you felt from the inside? Inside, yeah. Right, at, yeah, right. right at the beginning. Yes, and, right. And then a lot of times with people with eating disorders, they often, the part where it will be too, it's, it's not all, completely true that it would be too upsetting to criticize my therapist and oh, that's yeah. the best one and this is oh, where cool. it's so awesome that you can get at this the niceness stuff and oh you know, neat yeah do you see a lot of that niceness stuff in the eating disorders yeah 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 especially especially with anorexia and compulsive overeating not so much with bulimia interestingly oh enough. yeah <laughs> but um i don't want to generalize too much there but yeah. um, I love it because, you know, I think the empathy and connecting of, is obviously, you know, vital. And yeah. I always say, like, you've taught me, uh, you know, it's absolutely, you know, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient for change. And you're saying, you know, with, you know, you really wish this could be different, you know, with the right. miracle cure question. So I use the testing, use the ETS. With cool. it, usually by the second or third sessions, I, you know, I'm getting the twenties and it, yeah. it's good. There's a, the, the dangle and the one that, that we get, it's great to work on is that it would be too upsetting to criticize my therapist. Yeah. When I see that, I say, I'm glad you checked that off because I don't think I could take it either. I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but that, yeah, it's so valuable when, the, it's when they so do true. that. I was doing a live uh, demo with Jill. Uh, we're going to actually, uh, put it as a podcast but this woman with had horrible public speaking anxiety and and you know we were just doing perfect empathy jill was she's just fantastic but yeah. when i concentrate i can be decent too i was at my best and jill was at her best and then when we used the what's my grade technique at the end of the empathy and this was before a huge live audience and she said i, I guess I'd, I'd give you a b and my heart just sunk because mm -hmm. that's like a failing grade Right. And and then I said, could you tell us, you know, the part we missed? And she stammered and hemmed and hawed. And then she revealed uh, that she'd had this bedwetting problem all throughout childhood and didn't disappear until she was 13 years old. And her parents were constantly taking her to hypnotists and mental health professionals and doctors and saying, you kind of, you've, you've got to get, get over this. And when she said that, she just started sobbing. And then the audience just suddenly was was loving her. And she was just thinking everyone would be kind of judging her. And it just transformed the, the session. The, the, but, but if we hadn't measured it, in this case with a, a simple verbal measure, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we would have missed it com completely. Mm -hmm. And these scales that are so sensitive to the smallest therapeutic failures, and I always hate it when I get anything other than a perfect grade. But then when I do, and I just respond with warmth and humility at the next session, tell me what I missed. It sounds like I wasn't understanding how you felt inside. And and then that just opens like a flower opens up. Mm -hmm. But but you've got to be willing to uh, to be humble and to experience the, the death of the therapist's ego. And I can imagine that, that there's so much secretive behavior too in yeah. working with with the uh, with, with with the eating disorders, and uh, that it, ta it takes a lot of th therapeutic skill, just like dancing. You could teach me to dance, and I'm a quick learner, and I could probably learn some complex stuff, but I would look horrible doing it because I don't have the aptitude. And you, and you, you have to have the the therapeutic skill to to connect with people in a tender and trusting way and to, to make miracles happen in their life. Now we'll put your contact information in the show notes for sure. But uh, everyone doesn't read the show notes. Most people probably won't get a chance to. So if somebody uh, is, I guess, in New York and, and mm -hmm. is struggling with the 
overeating, uh, or, uh, you know, eating and vomiting, which is what bulimia is, or anorexia, mm -hmm. kind of starving yourself and thinking mm -hmm. you're never, never thin enough, mm -hmm. uh, or any of the problems we've described. And they wanted to touch base with you and uh, mm -hmm. maybe call and, and, and see if they'd be, uh, a consultation would be mm -hmm. appropriate. How, what's the best way for folks to uh, contact you? If you go to my website, which is just uh, DonnaFish.com, one word, then there's a, you could get, do a 15 minute telephone uh, complimentary consultation and you could just, there's a way to click on the little email icon and they can click on that and shoot me an email or they could just send me an email at Donna at DonnaFish.com. And, oh, yeah, or um, Donna at DonnaFish.com or go to the website DonnaFish.com. Yeah. That sounds great. Is there anything else you wanted to tell us? Because this is a rare chance for us to, you know, you, you, you can't really learn how to treat something. Someone wrote to me and said, are you going to, why don't you do a, 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 a PTSD book for, for veterans who have been in Iraq and Afghanistan? Because uh, I... I, I've done, you know, f a whole bunch of trauma workshops around the U.S. and Canada. And I wrote back and said, I couldn't possibly write a book like that because I haven't treated any of them. They all go to the VA. They don't right. come come to me. And it's right. ridiculous to try to, to be an expert in something unless you've had a vast amount of professional experience treating people and, and a, as a bonus, some personal experience w w with it as well. And that puts you into the into the expert category and and now I don't even know what I was saying except it sounds like you've had a heck of a lot of experience <laughs> and 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 really have the the expertise and gracefulness that goes along with with that and 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 being able to create what's really mir miracles in in people's lives the, the the first anorexia patient I had was soon after I opened my practice and I was referred to a young woman from the inpatient unit at uh, the University of Pennsylvania Hospital who had had severe mm -hmm. anorexia, and they sent her to me for follow-up, I think because I was a cognitive therapist, mm -hmm. although, you know, cognitive therapy was pretty new at the time, and, and the addiction techniques hadn't been worked out. But I remember we, I worked with her for a year, and we were in a power struggle every mm -hmm. session because right. right. she wanted to talk and have me support her, uh -huh. and I wanted her to do my the techniques with the daily mood log and, and all, all of that. Yeah. And and so finally, I presented her, I think maybe I presented her in one of Dr. Beck's, Beck's weekly seminars. And I don't know if he said it or if I came up with it myself, but he said, why don't you just offer uh, to compromise with her? Tell her she can have 50% of each session just to talk and then 50% of each session to work on the problems in her life and her mm -hmm. thoughts about, you know, binge, or mm -hmm. bomb, starving herself and, and all of this. And, and then that work, we got on the same page and she became uh, delightful to, to work with. But I can remember that it, it was more than just yeah. knowing techniques. No, way there more. Was the and, art yeah. of, of, of relating to a human being. Exactly. And that motivational piece is so vital at the beginning, especially because there's so much of a desire to not change or not do what they are going to, the process resistance. And um, I used to changing the focus uh, the other day with a patient, a fairly new patient, and talking about my own feelings of frustration and, and in some ways anger too. And at the yeah. same time, and it was, it t totally turned it around. Yeah, and, and now we're sort of actively into the mode of rolling up our sleeves and working on things, and she's actively doing homework and the addiction. That's fantastic. Mood log. There is so much that can be helpful to people, and, and it just seems trivial when you hear it. Like sometimes therapists should express their feelings. Oh, that sounds good. Well, people that haven't gotten it yet. Well, and, but to say, you yeah. know, that changing the focus, I mean, that is huge. Yeah, yeah. And that is something that I use myself in, in the work, you know, and it dovetails beautifully with team. I will like, I just want to say one last thing, which is that what really drives me and which just excites me no end to the work is that I am truly passionate about food and I love to help people love to eat and enjoy eating and be free from guilt and yeah. over preoccupation. And I know it's doable. 
I have helped many people get to that outcome yeah. and I love it. I'm passionate about it. So well, I have really two questions for it. you <laughs> then. First of all, what, what is your favorite food? Uh, I, I'm an equal opportunity employer. I love all food, honestly. Do you have any eth I ethnic favorite? Every, or? No, I love everything. It's really, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I don't think there's few foods I don't eat and won't eat. And I love meat, too, I have to confess. And my kids are vegan, two are vegan, one is a vegetarian. It's like, oh, my goodness. For my kids, um, my oldest daughter's 16th birthday, we all became vegan for a month, and I lasted about two weeks. <laughs> oh, I bet that was hard. Yeah, I'm a, more I power call, to you. I'm a meatitarian. What can I say? Yeah. But, how, many, how many kids do you have? I have three kids. My youngest just graduated college. Two? Three. Oh, three. three. Fan yeah. How old are they? They are 27, 20, almost 26, and 20, almost 22. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. And my last question is this. You know, um, I talk about the deaths of the, the self for the patient, the four deaths of the self, and the four deaths for, for the therapist. And speaking from the patient perspective, you know, the, the death of the self to recover from depression is accepting the fact that you're really not special. Mm -hmm. and, and no one wants to do that, but that's... It, but leads to enlightenment. The death of the self in anxiety disorders is confronting the monster that you fear the most. And that, of course, is exposure, and that leads to a second kind of enlightenment. And the death of the self in treating relationship problems is that you have to, and this is the worst one, in my opinion, realize that you've been blaming someone else for the problem. And when you look at your own role, you're, you're going to see that you're the cause of the problem. And that's very humiliating and shocking. It's also freeing. And that's the interpersonal, that leads to interpersonal enlightenment, that we create our own interpersonal reality at every moment of every day. That's three of the four deaths. Now, what is the death of the self in the treatment of habits and addictions like, like overeating? All I've been able to do is kind of approximate it and say it's the death of the entitled pleasure-seeking self. But I, I, that might might not really I, say it. I think it's the death of the idea that there's like a win-win somewhere. That, that any, there's a what? A win-win as a part of a decision-making mm -hmm. analysis. That like somehow there's no cost to it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the death of that, you know, the sort of denial that yeah. no matter what we do, there's a cost to it or there's a consequence, right? And it, it might, there's no advantage, advantage. <laughs> yeah, I see. I always say, you know, in life, no matter how fabulous it is, there are disadvantages of anything that has advantage. So okay. everything is both, right? It's yeah. Win -win. Right. And then what's the reward of experiencing that death? Dealing with reality? being able to actually have accomplished things and, and get some success in, in a change that you're wanting and really working towards liberate, liberation. Yeah, you know? yeah. The, yeah, I think one of the things is the discovery that you, you didn't really need that thing you thought you needed. Well, that's the, true, yeah, the, 100%. That you can be 100% yeah. as happy with, with, without that thing that just seems so like life is going to be worthless without, yeah, you know, yeah. getting zonkered every night or eating all I want or, or whatever the, the thing is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's okay. been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I love the way you're so beautifully adhering to the team model while at the same time bringing in all kinds of elements that are absolutely life-changing and, and, and vitally important in the treating of the eating disorders. And there's at least one final mind-blowing thing <laughs> that uh, uh, Rhonda is going <laughs> to say uh, to finish our, this wonderful uh, interview. You know, the, the, what struck me throughout this entire interview is the power of the team model. You know, you talked about somebody who had surgeries and gained and lost a hundred pounds three times. I think I'm catching that right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you said things to her that she'd never heard before. And, mm -hmm. and you got her to a place where, you know, she was at a 
at least a baseline where she was happy or content with her weight. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's that probably just herself. one example of probably many of your patients that you're working with team. And I just think that the more we highlight how t the team therapy model is used with, you know, a variety of types of, um, I don't know if the right word is disorders or conditions and different therapists, people can see that the team model can be transferable to anything, any, any psychiatric or psychological condition. And I just, I just loved everything and all of the examples that you gave us, Don. It's been really a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. Thank and then you. what I what I notice is the same as with with Matt May. You, you see, Matt is also an expert in team, but what a beautiful person he is at the same time. And in uh, talking to you, Donna, I'm I'm seeing what a beautiful person you are and how steeped you are, and not only methodologies at your fingertips. I'm sure there's dozens, if not hundreds of techniques that you tap into and concepts and ideas, but that I can see that someone coming to you is coming to a healer who, who, who's going to connect with you. And, and if, if you're up for it, if you want it, help, help you cha change, change your life. And, and you've touched and changed many lives and you're going to be continuing to touch and change the lives of, of, of so many people in such important ways. And thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for being you. And, and good to see you again yeah, after yeah. so many years. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Till Goodbye, next time, everybody. Everyone. Thanks for listening. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.